Okay. Hi, everyone. This is, uh, this is a good panel to be on, I feel, today, part of the uh, It's Time Festival, and uh, we are the mother of all invention, which is exciting. Um, and as the time of recording, we've just had news that there is a pandemic that's about to be approved, approved the vaccine, sorry, that's about to be approved, which might end the pandemic or begin to end the pandemic uh, as, as early as the end of this year. And we've had a, an election result in the US. So on uh, both a climate front and an innovation front, I feel like this is a happy day and also a good day to be having a conversation like this. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I'm going to introduce you all, if I may. Um, today we have three uh, really interesting businesses, all of whom are looking at the climate emergency from the perspective of waste and reduction of waste and reuse of waste. It's so interesting and different. Um, so let me first, I'll start with George May, who is in charge of BioBean, and I'm going to let you talk about your company a little in a second, but thanks for joining us. Thank you. We have May al Karuni from Globechain, which uh, I think has been described as the eBay of reuse, is that right? Which sounds pretty good. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for being here. And we have Jilen Irakosi, who is in charge of Waste Zone which uh, is connecting the world of recycling right back with the household. Is that right? Okay, yeah, so, yes, sir. Fantastic to have you on here. Jillian, I'm going to start with you. Um, tell me where you are. Where are you Zooming in from today? Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm based in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh -huh. So uh, it's in East Africa. Yeah. So yeah, um, I'm founder of Waste Zone. So at Waste Zone, uh, we are on a mission of leveraging technology to create a waste-free world. So what we do, we provide uh, household or end consumers in general. Uh, we provide them an app uh, that connects them with recycling actors uh, for efficient waste collection, sorting, and traceability. Uh, so uh, typically, the technology itself assists the recycling actors to outsource raw materials from the household, while on the other hand, helping uh, the household to get rid of their electronic waste by selling them. So, uh, I mean, so far we have transacted over 480 tons of electronic waste. Wow. So this is an equivalent of um, over 2,600 metric tons of carbon emissions diverted. So, uh, yeah, and uh, we have almost over uh, 500 uh, uh, constant users uh, who are based here in Rwanda and other East African nations. And that's fantastic. How long have you been going? Uh, so it's been two years. So we found the startup in 2018. Okay. And so, yeah, it's been like almost two years. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, congratulations. That's a great start. Um, May, tell us about Globechain. Tell us what you do and how long have you been in business? Yeah, so we've been um, running for five years and um, I set the company up because um, I used to work for an investment bank and we moved offices across the road and they disposed of all their furniture and carpets and everything and it got me thinking why is no one digitalized waste so that's how basically how Globe Chain started and in essence it's a marketplace and we connect corporate companies to charities and small businesses to reuse and redistribute unneeded items, but we work in the B2B space. So we focus in retail construction and um, hospitality. So everything from fixtures and fittings, obsolete stock all the way through to construction material, um, a lot of refurbs, office furniture and so on. Um, we've done around about uh, 6 million kilos from landfill, 4 million savings to charities. Um, and we launched last year in Spain and this year in New York. So we're based in UK, Spain, New York and um, UAE. And we've got around 10,000 members. Uh, we do something quite unusual. We collect um, ESG data on the giving. So when corporates give away their items, we collect data on like the social, economic and environmental impacts of where those items are going. And, I, and it's a bit, it sounds like it's doing an enormous amount of good in the world, but it is a business, right? This is a, it is a business, yeah. It's, it's absolutely for profit because um, we have a strap line. We believe in commercial with a conscience. Mm -hmm. um, in order for things like this to scale, you need, you, know, you need quite a lot of money and quite a lot of scalability and technology. And um, as a business, I believe this is the future of how companies are going to be anyway going forwards. And maybe not just um, businesses, right? Like this exactly, whole yeah. 
situation yeah. fashion i do a lot of work in fashion there's so many uh, areas that this is uh, this is the future right so great yeah. great to have you here thank you and george tell us about bio bean which actually i know about because i'm a coffee obsessive but for the uh, benefit of everybody else give us the background on bio bean yeah thank you um so uh, I suppose the, the, the headline is that we're the world's largest recycler of spent coffee grounds. So we're, we're a UK based business um, we have a, a processing plant in, in Cambridgeshire um, and we, we collect and process grounds from, from sort of businesses, you know, of all shapes and sizes, all scales across the country. Um, so whether that's the independent coffee shops on the high street through the big chain like Costa, Stansted Airport, Birmingham Union, up to the instant coffee manufacturers. So, we, we work with existing sort of waste management infrastructure. So we, we'll partner with the Veolias and, and the First Miles as well, who'll collect the grounds on our behalf. They'll aggregate them, deliver them to us. And then we process them into a range of, of, of bio-based products that are both B2B and B2C. Um, the way to displace the need for fossil-based fuels. So like the coffee logs actually that are over my shoulder, a, a domestic heating product. So for multi-fuel burners, wood stoves, that kind of thing. Um, through a biomass pellet that, that goes into industrial biomass boilers for greenhouses, process dryers, dairies. Um, and then also we, we extract the residual flavor compounds from the, the spent grounds to be used back in food and beverage applications. So looking to provide a, a, a truly sustainable flavoring ingredient that, that provides a, a particular sort of flavor profile for ready to drink coffee drinks, alcoholic beverages, dairy based products. Um, and then actually sort of more and more we've been seeing um, sort of innovations around using the, the dried grounds that once we've processed them, decontaminated them, dried them to a consistent moisture content and, and screened them to a specific um, particle size, we can supply a whole range of industries with a, with a raw material. So whether that's bioplastics, um, we're talking to people in the cosmetics industry, in the automotive industry, in the sort of printing inks uh, industry as well. So, so really seeing a, a whole route whereby coffee grounds that were previously just sort of dumped into to landfill or discarded without any second thought are now being sort of, you know, reprocessed and used back in, in the supply chain in a, you know, in a, in a circular or at least sort of oval uh, manner. Um, that means that they're not being wasted. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's by being in a nutshell. Um, we process about seven and a half thousand tonnes of coffee a year at the moment, um, capacity in the UK to, to process 16,000 tonnes. And, and sort of at the moment also looking at how we scale into, into Europe and beyond with a, a processing plant overseas. Thank you. Um, I love it. I've burnt the logs. I've actually, um, I've burnt coffee logs because I was told about you a couple of, was it about a year ago maybe? And I, I said, I don't believe in. So someone uh, procured me some coffee logs, uh, which is an exciting moment. But I am interested in, for all of you, and actually you talked a little bit about it, May, about your, exp your personal experience of moving company and uh, moving you know premises and realizing how much just got wasted and that was your inspiration i'm interested in the coffee bean who had the idea like where what was the spark there that kicked off presumably a whole stream of innovation uh yeah so it's actually um it was our, our founder a chap called arthur k when he was he was a student he was an architecture student and was looking at sort of sustainable buildings and and sustainable businesses and uh was quite literally looking at his cup of coffee and noticed the film of oil on top of the cup of coffee and that got him thinking about the oil content of, of coffee grounds and what could be extracted from them you know and how you can derive value from this so that that's what sort of kick-started the the thought and and uh, yeah roll forward a few years and, and here we are now sort of you know scaled up business so would you say it was a kind of curiosity as opposed to a driving climate ambition at that point which is of course totally fine uh yeah i mean obviously you know i can't sort of talk for arthur's mindset i mean he, you know he, he's his interest is was sustainability, sustainable cities, um, you know, sort of urban architecture and looking at. So it would have been both a curiosity, but also this, this, you know, the, the premise of the need to do something more sustainable with waste streams. Um, you know, I think the, the very premise of, of the business, and, and I've been here for five and a half years now, so sort of quite a long time in terms of its, of its life. And, and it is that, that ethos that, you know, it, waste should be seen a resource, you know, we, we want to drive behavior change. We want to, to create, you know, big change at last. You know, we, we want to, to help people see that there is more that can be done with, with waste streams and, and actually that things have to be done now. Um, you know, there is sort of no, no, no second chance coming around. It's about immediate action and, and finding scalable ways of doing that, right? It, it has to be, as I think 
you know, all three of us on the, on the panel would agree. It's about scale. Um, and if you really want to, to drive impact, it has to be done at scale. So whether that's electronics, you know, secondhand furniture from, from office moves or, or coffee grounds, it's about demonstrating it at scale. And that drives the behavior change, that drives the impact. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and you know, from small beginnings can come global scale, absolutely. Um, Jillian, can I come to you? Because I think that your company started interestingly also did i read about it, it was a, a sort of student collaboration initially tell us a bit about how your idea came about yeah so initially uh we went on a school assignment uh like i was 11 years old and uh, uh we actually uh faced a tragic incident uh where alongside my friend we survived a garbage landslide accident and such tragic incident inspired us to put more effort into what we can do to ensure that uh, the waste is diverted from going to landfills. Wow. So uh, generally here in East Africa and most of African nations, uh, waste are actually uh, ending up in landfills and landfill uh, it serves as such like a big issue because uh, we don't have like enough recycling infrastructure to recycle all the waste generated. So uh, basically you almost find that um, some incidents like uh, accidents that happens in such uh, uh, neighboring uh, areas in those uh, run field uh, areas. So we actually founded a waste zone uh, with like a simple vision of creating a waste free world based on uh, personal experience. And did it come out then, who were, you, who were your founders, your fellow founders? Were these university colleagues or were they, how did you all get together? Uh, so, uh, we initially, we were high school uh, mates when we uh, went through the university and that's where we actually, uh, but we, prior to founding Waste Zone, we initially involved into uh, uh, volunteering with some uh, local organizations that were actually doing some environmental campaigns and we uh, did love the idea of creating uh, Waste Zone uh, basing on the um, experience we're actually seeing on the ground, like people were actually producing uh, electronic waste and uh, they didn't know how uh, they can uh, reuse them or uh, recycle them. And we thought about uh, creating a marketplace where they can actually sell the electronic waste. And uh, pricing itself was one of the biggest issue because uh, there's no transparency uh, between the recycling actors and the household. So we just uh, introduced an algorithm that helps uh, recycling industry to estimate uh, the price for electronic waste. And this actually uh, became like a working business model because uh, recycling industries are able to get uh, uh, materials which can really be beneficial to their business model. Uh, while on the other hand, household get rid of their electronic waste while also getting money. Yeah. Yes, but no, it's fine. I want, to, I want to join. Does it come all the way to Somerset, England yet? Because I've got too much email. <laughs> Where does it typically end up? Or is that too complicated a question? Oh, no, no. So uh, we have certified recycling industries. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are really sure that all the waste transacted on our platform are actually ending up recycled completely. Yeah. It's so reassuring, isn't it? I don't know about everybody else on the panel, but if, when I hear about... Um, industries like this and, and, and breakthroughs like this, it makes me relax a little because it makes me less fearful of, as you say, these sort of horrible garbage mounds and, and there's just the waste of it all. Um, May, interested how, you, so did you just walk out of a career in banking and found this business yourself? I mean, how was that journey? I'm sure nothing's that simple, but the, the way you explained it to me, it sounded like it might be. Yeah, I didn't wake up going, uh, when I grow up, I want to work in waste. <laughs> <laughs> <That's not like laughs> <that. laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was now. Um, yeah, it, it is now. Absolutely. Um, no, it's, um, it, it's kind of, um, I'd say every like entrepreneur probably has a gut feeling and, um, it's, it's a pain point, right? That you see a solution for something. And these, I'm going back in the days when like sustainability and the word reuse wasn't even used. The word like secure economy wasn't, didn't even exist and there wasn't even a market cap. So it was, it was just purely because I just saw that waste and um, it was a time where Airbnb and Uber was just becoming famous in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, why has no one set something up like that for the waste market and digitalize the waste industry? And 
I just sent a couple of emails out to a couple of companies and lo and behold, the largest retailer in the UK came back to me and was like, we'll trial it. So I actually just spent 800 pounds on a website, um, got it, got it, got a freelancer to develop what I thought could be a good product. If I look back at it now, it's probably pretty shocking. I don't yeah. know how they said yes to it. It's like an embarrassment, but it was, it's definitely one for the archives and framing on the wall, like what the first website looked like. But, um, but um, just from there, it started growing and then very similar um, to the pricing side, um, the, the, the waste market isn't very transparent in the UK because there are multiple things involved with it, logistics, warehousing, labor costs. So it was very difficult to break down and do a like for like comparison. And I just thought, well, we're so innovative and out there, we should just kind of create our own industry of reuse. And, and then eventually the economy like caught up and circular economy is worth 4.3 trillion now. So there's a market cap to like justify, you know, our business model. But the early days, for sure, I was told uh, this isn't a business model and it's never going to work. And, you know, obviously now <laughs> it's a bit of a different story. But um, yeah. but yeah, we um, it, it took probably, I'd say, the first two years quite crucial. The second year is always the tough point in, in business and startups particularly. It's the make or break year. But um, from my banking background, I always used to rem remember the VCs because I used to fundraise um, for VCTs and things like that. They used to say, you know, make sure it makes money from day one. So my focus from a commercial business model modeling was like, how can we generate revenue quite quickly from it without going, oh, we're going to get volumes of people using it. And then that's how the money is going to come, you know, through funding. So we, we broke even year three, I think, but obviously that's a very lean team. And then year four, I got VC funding. So it was, a. Uh, there's no overnight success. You have to you know, super hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and actually, you're very. This I was reading an article just last night about there are so few women in uh, in business, in entrepreneur kind of startup land, and yeah, we, yeah. Land. So you, yeah, we were the. Um, I was well. one of only females in the UK that year to raise more than half a million. Well, less than one percent wow. that year. Hopefully it's yeah. improved by then, but you never know. <laughs> well, let's hope so. We'll keep going. Uh, no disrespect to you chaps, of course. Uh, just level of the play, level in the playing field. Um, tell, what is the business model behind it? Because I think it's very inspiring that you just see a gap and you go for it and you throw 800 quid at it and it's possible to grow. But what is the model behind it? So who pays for what and, and how does that work? Yeah, so um, we, um, there's three reasons companies use us to reduce waste costs and divert the waste from landfill. Uh, the speed items are picked up, so we're quite well known for like less than 24 hours reservation because of the network effect. Uh -huh. And then the final area is the data. You know, the data is very valuable for them. So from that, um, we realized the companies would be the ones paying. So we charge an annual or pay-as-you-go or project subscription fee. So we're a SaaS-enabled marketplace. So we're SaaS in the sense of the model pricing, but our face is marketplace. It's like a hybrid. Um, and then um, uh, the taking is for free, but we make people pay for the logistics. And the reason we do that is we found over time and research shows, interestingly, people over time don't respect free stuff. So there, there's no shows and so on. Whereas if they're paying for logistics for very valuable items for companies, we have absolutely almost zero no shows because people are making a commercial decision to pay for logistics in order to pick up goods that they want because there's a value to them on that. So, so that's how the model works and that gives that balance of the philanthropic side with the, the commercial element of it. Um, and uh, yeah, and we're integrating at the moment logistics in there to provide even faster kind of quotes and career systems, but that's in essence how, how we make our money. And now scaling across three markets. I mean, that's a lot, that's a lot of logistics, well done. But how many are you in total? I always find this fascinating to learn it's about. a team. In we total. are five people. <laughs> three markets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Five people. Yeah, because nice. um, that's, that's the kind of marketplace vibe, right? Uh, marketplaces, you know, it's very hard to get them off the ground. And we don't control supply or demand, if you think about it. Like e-commerce, there's always one side you can control. Um, but once you get that kind of tipping point or that liquidity in the members... Um, the scalability is in the technology. So, you know, once our marketplace is set up and structured from an architect tech, a technology yeah. side of things, yeah. um, really it's about the execution and growth. And then obviously that brings on good people, good talent, 
your mission and you know other other things <laughs> so you're five that's amazing um, I would like to shift, if I may, to, and ask, I'll come back to you on the same question, but I'll start with George. I'm really interested in, um, so, uh, as much as you can, how do you quantify your impact on the climate emergency? So I realise that's a huge question, but to break it down a little, what, what bit of the climate emergency do, is your business in particular addressing, or bit or bits? And, and how do you measure yourselves? Like how, you know, what, what metrics are you aiming at and what, do you, what does success look like? So yeah, let me ask George, tell, tell us about beans and what they, what they yeah. add to the picture. Yeah, so uh, it's, it, like I said, it's a, it's a big question. And we, I suppose we focus on some that are more quantifiable than others in terms of sort of metrics. So the, the obvious one and, and the most tangible one, I suppose, that people know about it is, you know, carbon. So we look to quantify our, our CO2 savings compared to if coffee grounds are sent elsewhere. So we've we've had a carbon uh, footprint talk, you know, LCA um, life cycle assessment done of, of the bio being processed from collection through processing through end product use and compared that to if grounds are put into to either landfill or anaerobic digestion. So for, for biogas, which is typically where they, they'd end up. And um, obviously some might end up in a few other places. But um so we can quantify what the saving is compared to those two and compared to putting coffee grounds into landfill, we save uh, 80% on CO2 e emissions and 70% compared to, to anaerobic digestion. So for us, I think the, 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 the AD comparison is really important. You know, AD anaerobic digestion is, is where people would typically suggest organic waste streams are sent. And it, you know, it's very effective at, at processing high carbohydrate, high sugar content, you know, waste streams like that. Coffee doesn't work particularly brilliantly in, in a in a in a AD plant. It has re relatively low biomethane yields. It's granular. It doesn't break down very well. So actually, you know, compared to that process, what what we offer is, is significantly more environmentally sustainable, environmentally friendly. You know, has a greater impact in terms of of sort of the, the climate emergency, if you like. Um, and so we're saving somewhere in the region of sort of 400 kilograms of, of CO2 for every ton that we process. Um, so that's 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 you know that's a sort of the quantifiable piece. I think that that for us as well, there's a and I sort of touched on it earlier. There's a bit around sort of behaviour change and understanding and and without wanting to be preachy about you know sort of education and and demonstrating to people that there is there is more to be there is more to do with these resources than than had previously been thought. And where previously there was a, a very linear economy, um, and I think. Uh, the other two, the other two guys on the on the on the panel have got you know great examples of that. Where previously, furniture went straight out of an office and onto a landfill site, or someone chucked a you know old computer onto a big heap somewhere, whatever it might be. You know, actually now it's about reimagining that, and I think that that behaviour change. So for us, it's about this understanding that we can't sort of wait for legislation to come and tell us what we've got to do. Um, consumers demand it, industry needs to lead with it, and I think. Whilst big business has this great opportunity to, to implant things in people's minds, actually it's a lot of innovative, smaller, more agile businesses coming through that really can change the way things are done. And, and I think perhaps our three businesses are a good example of that. Yeah, I mean, I'd like, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could all become big businesses? Yeah. You know, uh, we make, will. You do. Not if, when. <laughs> when, exactly. Make sure that Uber and Airbnb and like this is, this is big stuff. Uh, Jillian, can I come down to you again? And just ask about how do you measure success? I mean, you're, you're younger than the other businesses, but what is it that particularly you're aiming to do for the climate emergency with your business? And, and how do you measure your success in getting there? Oh, well, uh, we, we focus on um, uh, creating the carbon emission. So uh, because uh, we actually focus on um, key Two key metrics. Uh, so we, uh, the first one, we focus on uh, carbon emission diverted at resource extractions, uh -huh. uh, because uh, here in electronic waste, we are really focusing about reducing the resource extraction. And uh, the second metric is uh, diverting waste from the landfills. So basically, carbon emission that would have been um, diverted by the waste in the landfills. So uh, uh, as our, our business model focuses on uh, three principles of circular economy, like uh, electronic reuse, remanufacturing, and repairing, so we ensure that um, we collect data uh, each time, like each transactions. Uh, so we have like relevant data 
So basically, uh, that are equivalent to each uh, carbon uh, transaction on our platform. So uh, on top of that, we also uh, have other key metrics uh, which we uh, use to measure the impact. So we are really almost focused uh, in job creation, uh, so uh, creating green jobs, uh, uh, both direct and directory. So right, so far we have created um, 10 direct jobs and uh, all partners we are working with. So we show that we collect more information from them and how many people they are employing. And right now uh, we have also created like uh, over 80 uh, indirect jobs. Okay. And so uh, we just make sure that um, green impact goes in hand with social impact just to create something bigger. Um, so like, by applying the reuse and remanufacturing and repairing, uh, it's more than like we are reducing the resource extraction. And uh, as you know, like a climate change and increase in resource extraction are interlinked. 62% of the global greenhouses gases are released when extracting and processing and manufacturing materials, especially electronic based materials. So therefore developing tech enabled logistics for electronic reuse, remanufacturing and repairing uh, here at West Zone, we are mitigating climate change uh, by reducing the emission that will be raised by the waste in the run field or new resource extraction processing. Yeah. I get it. And I was thinking about George's point about consumer mindset and behavior change. How are you marketing yourself? Because it's such an opportunity to get people to not just either hoard it or fling it in the landfill. Um, it's not challenging given that in Africa generally people are reused to uh, all those free uh, uh, circular economy principle, reuse and manufacturing. So what we do, we actually uh, attach economical incentives. So uh, we all our market-based approach, we actually use uh, the fact that uh, they can gain money from uh, the electronic waste. And this actually is increasing the, the user base. So we have almost uh, recorded uh, a 20% of our annual growth rate in the numbers of users we had. So uh, yeah, like the market uh, incentive-based um, market approach is actually working on us here. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, it's all very inspiring. We're going to run out of time soon. May, how do, are you tracking your success? What is it you're, you head yourself against and how's it going? Um, I, well, I'm, well, that kind of depends. As a, as a business, we have our obviously own metrics. Um, we want to keep the high quality of like goods being reserved in 24 hours. So like velocity is quite important for us. Mm -hmm. At the same time as the data that we're collecting to always keep that advanced and um, our, our tech up to date. So I'd say that there are a couple of things. Um, on, the, on the more the social impact side, uh, really, we do quite a big mix. So obviously, the obvious things like kilos diverted and um, upskilling employment levels. But um, we have um, an internal version of our marketplace for reuse and loaning for corporates as well. So there's different data sets for them. So it just depends on um, it depends on the company, right? Like not every data metric is useful. Like for George, it's it you know it's to do with carbon because it's a huge part of the business, right? Whereas for us, it might be kilos and the impact socially, it, societally, it helps. So it depends all on the electronic side. So um, I think, you know, if somebody's going to look at that, the drivers need to be a mix of probably industry drivers, the clients, and as a company, how you need to grow as well. Um, obviously, revenue is, is the obvious one, but there's, you know, how do you get to the revenue by creating a really good product or service and, and then break down the metrics from that. And what I really like, as the founder of the Global Goals campaign, is that um, that all of these businesses are doing fantastic things for, in service of the planet, but also of people. You know, they just all of them demonstrate in their way the interconnectivity of doing good uh, for the world uh, in the in every sense. You know, the natural world and also our role within it. So uh, very inspiring. We have run out of time. I'm going to ask because this festival is all about not just inspiring entrepreneurs and businesses to do more for the planet, but also in our own lives, what can we do? So I'm just gonna ask from your perspectives and it could be to do with your business, where you live, or just in your opinion. But what if, uh, just give everyone an action who's watching to do in their lives every day, a small everyday action that's gonna improve uh, the state we're in. And I'm gonna be mean and I'm gonna go to George for that first. 
Uh, well, so my, my thing would always be to start small. I think the big thing, if you want to make changes, start small. And, and actually one of the things that we did a couple of years ago was get rid of all bottled products like soaps and shampoos and things like that. So mm -hmm. we now only have bars of soaps and bars of shampoos. Obviously the shampoo thing is less of a concern for me, but for uh, my wife and others who've got more hair, then it's, you know, it's more of a concern. But um, uh, yeah, so that we, we, it's that, so for me, you know, start small. And then you, once you've done that one small act, then you go on and you start, it's, it, it, it makes you think and you start to see other areas where maybe you could have, you know, you could do another little thing, move to loose leaf tea instead of tea bags. And, and so you grow and actually then over time, You've, you've made a whole raft of small changes that the sum of which add up to something significant. Nice, I totally agree with that. If someone got loads of hair, the shampoo bottles are a problem. Uh, May, you've got loads of hair as well. What's What would you uh, give out as your top tip that people can do um, for saving the planet? I think uh, be like your own community influencers, right? Uh, like find out your local initiative or something that you, you, know, you have a real passion for, as, as George said, just one thing and focus on it and just talk about it to people and, and try and persuade people to get on board with the same cause. Um, the power of like word of mouth and referral is so strong and people trust referrals. So, you know, that's one thing very easy you can do and, and, and build up on that. I agree, especially in these um, pandemic times, we've all become hyper local, haven't we? And, and we should build on that power. Uh, Jelaine, finally down to you, what is your, uh, tip for uh, one thing people can do to change their impact on the planet in a good way? Um, so I think uh, wherever you are, you can play a role in creating like a circular economy. Um, revisit your consumption and shopping habits and eliminate unnecessary materials and uh, reuse and repurpose your crops, compost, your kitchen waste. So generally ensure that you're living a waste-free lifestyle. And the overall idea behind that is actually creating uh, a waste-free environment where materials are kept in use a long time. So I guess I uh, just talked about uh, more than one tip. <laughs> oh, we've just lost you there. Uh, is it my Zoom or have we lost you, Lynn? I've lost him. Oh, we've just lost you. Well. That is a shame. But Hello. You're, 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 oh, Hello, you're, can you hear me? I can now. Yeah, yeah. I'll just talk about, um, so I think wherever you are, you can play a role in a sacred economy. So just uh, revisit your consumption and shopping habits and ensure that you eliminate unnecessary materials and reuse and repurpose your clothes and compost your kitchen waste. Generally ensure that you're living in a waste-free lifestyle. I really, I mean, I think that is, it's such a challenge um, to live waste-free. It's something that I'm sure we all try and the world is against us at the moment, but companies like yours in all their different ways are doing their bits to really help us live waste-free. So I thank you so much for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.